what we call geopolitics, and then African countries have their own geopolitics as well. idea. Thank you uh, for the insight. Uh, coming back to you, Professor Nobong, uh, we're going to continue in the same light uh, uh, with uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Adi said. As a political economist, and today if we're looking at uh, uh, geopolitical dynamics and seeing the effect on the African economy, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Adi already underlined the African continental free trade area, which I was actually going to come to it uh, subsequently. Now, we are looking at Africa's drive for financial independence. And uh, earlier on, uh, one of you made mention of, of the uh, plurality of powers across the African continent. And of course, uh, there is already the quest uh, to bring about uh, the fall in Western hegemony and see how we can bring alternative financial systems or money that can help boost the economies of the world, especially the economies of the African uh, uh, countries. So the question is, uh, how can, uh, in indulging with the, the aspect of multilateralism and also the, uh, uh, the global the dynamics across the Africa, how can African stakeholders uh, make use or maximize uh, the advantages? You mentioned in your analysis of that uh, these powers, when they come, they present an advantage or opportunities for the continent Africa and uh, debates have been ongoing regarding Africa's financial independence with the hike in geopolitical competition and other stakeholders coming into play. So what do you think African stakeholders can do practically uh, to ensure that uh, there is a, a, a gradual shift uh, that will see the continent have a legal tender that will facilitate trade among nations and of course uh, bring about economic buoyancy and economic development across Africa? Okay, um, uh, thanks for that uh, uh, question, Clarice. I think it's such a, it's a very broad, very broad question. And I will try to tackle it from, I'll try to isolate one or, or two corridors uh, to focus my response on. Uh, let me start with the trade dimension. The trade dimension, like the previous speakers have spoken about, there's the element, uh, there's the one opportunity that's represented by the African Continental Free Trade Area. Uh, that uh, the classical argument is the creation of a, a, a large uh, a market that is supposed to uh, have opportunities both for people who are wanting to come and do business with Africa, as well as enhance uh, Africa's competitivity with respect to the rest of the world. That is a practical uh, 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 low-hanging fruit that is within the, with, that is within the, 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 the decision-making power of the policymakers within Africa to, to promote that, make sure that it happens. And uh, the, the, the challenges uh, with respect to that um, are known, are well known and well documented. There are issues related to institutional capacity, the issues related to political will to be able to put into place and implement uh, decisions that have been taken to place. And of course, there are the more soft uh, interacting issues that have to do with the capacity of infrastructure uh, that links this 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 uh, these Af various African, African countries to enhance trade. Uh, during the last uh, French uh, Africa Investment Summit that uh, was convened by President Macron, I think President uh, Ramaphosa of South Africa, and I think uh, Denis Sassou of Congo. And I can't remember which other president put on the table the whole question of enhancing the energy uh, potential of the Inga Dam. So that's the infrastructure question and the release of infrastructure that relics, um, that has potential to power industrialization and go up and keep to Cairo. So those are the practical things that would put meaning to trade. Uh, being able to create the kind of uh, uh, infrastructure uh, linkages, uh, 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 both in road and rail and energy, that enhances trade. That says that the continents uh, and the countries of the continent are willing and they are ready to do business with whichever power that it is. Now, that, that the, the infrastructure question and the linkages that facilitate trade uh, can directly be linked to the question of financing. Um, and, and more, the multipolarity of the world means that there are now 
a, a diversity of sources of financing for such products. So when, when, when African presidents were in the French finance summit, they put it back on the G7 and the G8 and all the uh, traditional financiers to say this is a concrete project that would link our continents, that would enhance the growth and development of the continent to which you can put money. So European Investment Bank, Agence Française Développement, KFW, all your traditional classical World Bank, African Development Bank that has a large shareholding of wind powers, you do have an opportunity to be able to finance infrastructure project that promotes the integration of the continent, enhances its energy efficiency, and obviously creates conditions that are conducive for growth that would enable the, the continent to be able to take advantage of the continental free trade area. Practical issues. Within the same project, the multipolarity of the world then uh, practically means that if the classical to fin uh, traditional finance partners do not jump on such a project, the Chinas and the Russians uh, have that as an opportunity. And of course, when we talk of China, we talk of Russia, there are other power players, you know, within the middle that are also coming from, coming from coming strongly. So Africa then, in terms of preparedness to take advantage of these advantages, has to be able to then uh, get this project to be bankable because uh, having worked in that space most people would not come and do the 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 the, the low hanging soft foods uh, preparation project preparation for you it's a question of doing your project preparation documenting each of these projects and uh, getting to the point of bankability and then looking for the finan financier and and i think that increasingly i'm personally of the view that we are getting nearer to such a space where by the time we come back from speaking with the traditional western partners if they don't take on such projects we would have alternatives and, and that is the beautiful thing about the space in which we find ourselves that we can identify our priorities document the priorities show that they are bankable and then we have a, a, a multiplicity of potential financiers that will come on the project and increasing political freedom increasing political liberties essentially means that the hands of African leaders progressively and into an increasing measure, and I don't think we are completely there yet, but we are now getting to a space where they would have the political liberty, free from certain geopolitical influences, to be able to strike deals with an increasing number of a diverse range of partners. And I think that's beautiful, and I think that we need to be able to do more of such deals uh, when it comes to the question of trade and, and, and financing. Uh, apart from that, um, I think that the one emphasis I want to lay, one thing I want to lay emphasis on, uh, would be the human human capital development capabilities. So Africa, where it is, has a demographic demographic dividend. We have a young, growing population that is promising to be a very uh, a strong middle class. Now, every growing, prospering economy has the one characteristic of having a middle class that is educated, that spends. Uh, that drives the economy and becomes the backbone. And that middle class needs to be educated, it needs to be technically competent, and it also needs to be a generation. So I think that, that uh, uh, in terms of where the continent is sitting, um, that is a, a sleeping giant, a potential that has not been completely harnessed. Um, we do have capabilities at the moment scattered all across the diaspora. Our educational institutions and our science and research institutes are, do not yet demonstrate the kind of cutting edge advancement that it would take to sustain the kind of growth and development that we are aspiring for on the continent. It's not sufficient to have individual experts scattered in certain countries and scattered across in the diaspora, which I think Africa has an increasing significant number of those, um, including those of us sitting on this panel that uh, it can source from from its diaspora but that capability needs to be nested in the continent we need to get to a point where sitting in cameroon sitting in nigeria sitting in kinshasa in pretoria across the continent we have research institutions in advanced technology in almost any field imaginable i would personally think first of all in the areas that are of a competitive advantage to us, which is natural resources, and then obviously taking advantage of the fourth industrial revolution to be in the forefront of technological advancements. Now, one of the things that is akin, accustomed to the development of human capital is that it is intensive in the usage of human capital. You need skills to develop skills. And a critical mass of that, those skills needs to be reattracted back onto the continent. Um, I do not know well, let me just say I do not know. I think when you compare our research institutes and compare the capabilities of our universities with respect to what obtains in Asia or in the West, we still have, in my personal, in my opinion, a very long way 
to go in terms of building that capacity. We have the warm bodies, we have the numbers, we have the willing people, we have, we, for, for the average, and let me close with this point, Clarice. And our educational systems and institutions produce very capable graduates. The proof of that is that whenever we leave high school or leave graduate or first or second degree, anywhere in the world where we go, we excel. We excel, we, we, we stop, we step in there and we are top of our class and we are, we are the best scientists and the best economists and you name it. Now, the question which most people often then want to ask themselves is, the professors that train us before sending us overseas are sitting at our universities back home. Why are they not able to harness all of that know-how to transform the domestic economy? So it speaks of the, there's, there's a disjunct, they said they're missing elements. Personally, I feel that the missing elements have to do with soft elements, soft issues of institution, institutional culture, and the emphasis on science and technology and the whole political uh, will to be able to invest in those areas. I think that our university systems in Cameroon, for example, are too politicized. They need to be depoliticized and people to be allowed just to do pure science. You know, let the political science department be political involved in the politics of the country, but let the engineering and the medical faculty just be allowed to do medicine. You know, let the plant science faculty just be allowed to do plant science and let government provide the resources for them to do cutting edge research without having to have uh, a certain X or a certain Y nominated as head of department because he's uh, con politically connected to A or B. And I think that that is, is breeding inefficiency in the system. So the capabilities, the capacity, the human capital question, I think it's, it's a huge aspect that I think the continent really needs to invest in if we hope to take advantage of the demographic dividends to prepare the continent and the council of the continents to take advantage of the opportunities that are opening up for us in the future. And by the way, that human capital development I'm talking about also becomes the critical political force that we would need to negotiate and engage with these geopolitical strategic actors. Because I can show, I can assure you that my brother, uh, Dr. Elijah and Dr. Eddie, who is sitting there, if they are partners, if they sit across the table from any Canadian stakeholder wanting to do business in Cameroon for the sake of the argument, the confidence with which they would engage them, it's going to be far way more superior because these are their colleagues. These are the people whom they share corridors. They're sitting across the road and across the, 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 the corridor from these same people. So, so yes, investment in human capital, getting the skills and capabilities to come back and sit and to drive the development from our country and from the continent, I think it's it's one critical thing that we need to lay emphasis on. 